Sam, awesome job. Beautiful music this morning and beautiful singing too. Again, it's so good to be here with you this morning, uh, despite the, uh, the nasty weather outside. But I do have a confession I have to make. I'll tell you, I, I, I have always found it difficult to put sermons together. So I have the utmost respect for the men who have had the calling to put together the right words to say straight from the Bible and to come up with a sermon every Sunday. And I think maybe that's why a lot of ministers do series. Uh, it makes it a, a little bit easier. But I didn't want to do series. I, I wanted to do something that I felt you needed to hear. I'm looking at the demographics of, of the congregation. And then I try to find things in life that I can tie together. So sermons hit me when Debbie and I are in the middle of food line with the cart. I'll go, hey. <laughs> and this particular sermon was one I was going to do back uh, January 7th, but we had the snow uh, disaster, I guess, or was, we closed the church down. And uh, I've been saving it for today. I've tweaked it a little bit, so I've moved it a little bit forward there. But I need to explain how I found or came up with this sermon for today, which is from Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 17. Just three simple verses, but they're powerful verses. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> for the last several weeks, the sunspot activity has had a tremendous effect on radio propagation especially the high-frequency portion of the amateur radio bands. It's been open, great for radio communications. And since it was snowing outside, and since it was extremely cold outside, I thought it would be a great opportunity for me just to set aside the honeydew list and fire up my old amateur radio gear and, and play amateur radio operator. Now, the reason I mention this is I had the opportunity to converse with a couple of fellas, and they were talking about what the new year meant to them. And the one operator said it meant absolutely nothing to him. His focus was on his cattle ranch. This is out in Wyoming. His concern about January 1st, it was just another day as far as he was concerned, just with a new year attached to the end of it. For him, it was business as usual, no plans to change or alter anything. And I thought, wow, how many of us did the same thing? I've heard people go, well, I didn't even stay awake to watch the thing dro ball drop in New York. I just went to bed. It's just another day. And, and I said, yeah, I can understand that. And it made me think about just how life can make us so busy that we miss. Here today are still carrying the burdens from last year. Or how many of us are still carrying those burdens from, from day to day? They didn't change. How many of us had already filled out the first several weeks of your 2024 calendar back in December? <laughs> yes. Now, I realize that, that that's necessary. It, it's a necessary part of life, but it can also cause us to worry ahead about future dates, about things that aren't even here yet. Think about this. In, in uh, 344 days, when this year is over, will we look back at today with joy or will we look back at today with regret? Or will we sit here this morning ready to look to the future with excitement and anticipation? What do we as, as individual believers, what do we as a church need to do to break that mold, the mold we just talked about, to deviate from those old routines to something new for the rest of the year? Well, I feel that there's a passage of Scripture, and I want us to look at it this morning, because I believe it can help all of us look forward to the rest of 2024. But we need to do more than just look at this verse here. We need to do more than just read this verse. We need to understand this verse completely, and we need to apply it to our lives. The passage, again, is Ephesians chapter 5, three verses, 
15 through 17. And listen as I read them. It says, be very careful. Then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Wow. This passage by the Apostle Paul is not just about our time and, and how we manage it. No, it's sound biblical advice that offers each of us some very important lessons. And I think that we as believers need to, to consider these lessons. For one thing, it says, be very careful. Be very careful how you live. Why? Because our time here on earth is limited. In Psalm 39, one verse, verse 4, the psalmist says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. That's provocative. That's a lot of thinking right there. And again, in Psalm 90, one verse, verse 10, it says, Our days may come to 70 or 80 years if our strength endures, Yet the best of them are trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Wow. Now let's look back for a moment to when you were young, because 60 and 70 and 80, even 90 years old, man, that's way off. I'm not worried about that. I got too much stuff I need to do. You never thought about age because... Here you were bouncing around in a room full of old people. You had nothing to worry about. And then one day you woke up and you were the old person in the room. But let's, let's stop right there because I don't want us to focus on, on age here. No, I want us to focus on our time and how we view that time and how it's relative to the observer because it is. Look, look at it this way. A husband and wife are driving home from somewhere. It could be vacation somewhere. And the wife says she needs to stop at the store and buy a loaf of bread. So the husband pulls into the parking lot. The wife gets out and she goes into the store. She goes straight to the bread rack. She selects the bread. She goes to the counter and she waits her turn in line. She pays for the bread and she comes back to the vehicle. Now, while that's taking place, let's look at the husband. What in the world is she doing in there? She must be buying the whole store. It does not take that long to buy bread. Come on. Mm -hmm. The time that passed was the same time, wasn't it? What appeared as a quick stop for the wife seemed to be an eternity for the husband while he was waiting in the vehicle. In Psalm 90, verse 12, we read, by asking God for help regarding its reality, Moses makes a, a really a vital statement about preparing, preparing and understanding for the time that we have been granted and when it will end. And he basically says, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So let's just give the husband and wife stopwatches. Here you go, dear, you're going into the store. Are you ready? Go. And when she comes back out, they hit the buttons. Nothing to argue about now, is there? Because where was their focus? Their focus was on the stopwatch, on that time. And the time didn't deviate for either one of them. It was the same time. So there's no need to be, to be upset. So what does Moses mean then? Teach us to number our days. How do we number our days? Well, I feel that Moses, and it was a request to God. It wasn't a command or anything, just God, you know, how, teach me to number my days. What does that mean? Well, I believe that it means that we as believers need God to reveal to us the brevity of life. I'll say that again. We need for God to reveal to us the brevity of life. And that revelation then will help us gain a heart of wisdom. 
And as we know, wisdom's pretty daggone important because the choices we make during this brief stay on this earth do have eternal consequences. Jesus gives us a variable that also explains what happens when we don't number our days. From Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 19, Jesus describes a rich man who wanted to eat, drink, and be merry. Sounds like some of us when we were younger, wasn't it? Life was rolled around and revolved around me and what I want to do. This man had no time, no thought for God whatsoever. Why? Because he believed he had years. I've got years to enjoy myself. I don't have any problem. But God required his soul that very night. And the parable goes on to tell us if the rich man had only learned to number his days, he would have pursued ventures that had eternal significance. And I feel we too can learn from this parable because none of us know how many days we have been granted. We do not know. So we shouldn't waste them on selfish pursuits, on things that have no real value. And those who, (coughs) excuse me, have learned to number their days, spend them in pursuit of wisdom, spend them in pursuit of goodness, spend them in pursuit of the kingdom of God. They don't have to fear the wrath of God when their life is over. Jesus came to earth to make a way for us to be right with God. But we need to remember something. God's not going to chase you down. God's not going to force his gift of eternal life on you. So those who never learn to number their days spend their time as if life is all that there is. It's all about me and it revolves around me. And they forget, and and sometimes we forget that in Psalm 90, it warns about the judgment that they are destined to, that you will undergo if you do forget. But when we learn to number our days, we'll see that each day is a valuable gift. Each day is an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven. Paul also reminds us from our verse in Ephesians that we must make the most of every opportunity. We've got to make the most of every opportunity. And he gives us a reason why. He says, because the days are evil. Jesus said Satan was a thief. Satan was a robber. And one of the things Satan tries to steal from us is what? Our time. Because Satan knows that Time is very precious to us. Just think of the time that we waste in sinning. Think of the time we waste in all the places that you don't want people to know you've been. Think of all the time wasted in gossiping. Think of the time wasted in spreading rumors or telling little white lies mixed with some truths. Or think about the time wasted worrying about the consequences of the sins that you know you already committed. Why didn't the husband just go into the store with his wife and enjoy his wife together and come back to the vehicle together instead of having his little tantrum in the truck? I'm not even going to look over there because folks are, somebody punched somebody. (laughs) Yes, Satan is a a thief and a robber. But it's not just sin that makes demands in our time. Mm Mm-mm. Sometimes even good things can make demands too. Yes, good things can make demands too. Here's a familiar story that we find in Luke chapter 10. It's where Jesus went to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We recall that story. And Jesus sat down to teach. And Mary sat at his feet, focused. She was soaking in every word that Jesus said. Didn't want to miss anything. Meanwhile, out in the kitchen was Martha. And if you recall, Martha was upset. She was upset because Mary wasn't in the kitchen either. Now, this isn't in the Bible, but human nature tells me she was in the kitchen making noise. She was slamming cupboards, stomping on the floor, dropping silverware. She was being human. (laughs) And it made her even madder when no one came out to the kitchen to find out what all the noise was about. So she went to Jesus and complained. 
And she says, Lord, don't you care? My sister has left me to do the work by myself. Tell her to help me. Whew. And Jesus did not say, oh, my, oops. Sorry, Martha. Mary, get on out to the kitchen. In fact, it's my fault that you were in here. Let me come help and help, too. No, no, that's not in the Bible. Now listen to what Jesus and how we listen to Jesus and how he responds to Martha. And this is from Luke chapter 10, verse 40. Probably in a very, very calm voice, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, was Martha committing a sin by fixing the meal in the kitchen? No, not really. But here's where the problem was. She was so preoccupied with what she was doing that she didn't realize that the Son of God was in her living room. She missed it. Now, I can go back and defend the guys. You don't have to get punched or anything. Maybe in the parking lot. A lot of times when you travel... You don't speak to each other, husband, wife, not because you're angry. You're just thinking of different things, focused on the road, driving. The husband might be thinking, I'm going to be glad when this trip is over. I'll be able to park the car, get this thing unloaded. I got to do this. I got to do that. They create a list of things in their mind that they need to do. But the wife is thinking about the family. I need to get bread. I need to do this, do that. So when they stopped at the store, it wasn't that he was mad at her because she went in the store. It disrupted his thought. He was already home. He, would, he wanted to be there to finish that stuff. Those are the kind of things that happen. Those are the kind of things that happen in our life that cause us to make these mistakes. We can make the same mistake throughout the year. We get so caught up in the here and the now that we fail to deal with eternity. The things that are important, the things that are forever and ever. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, how many of us filled out our 2024 calendars in December? And how many of us now are worried about the things on that calendar that haven't happened yet? You don't have control over them, but we got to worry about them. We do. I feel we can all overload ourselves with commitments. We can commit ourselves to go here and to go there, to take, partake in this activity or to partake in this social function. Sometimes as a result, we'll run into ourselves, coming and going from, from different things. There are so many demands that, that take place in our lives that eat up our time, and we seem to forget there's only so much time in a day. What do I got to do, Bob? What do I got to do to make the most of every opportunity? Well, to answer that, let's go back to our verse and see what Paul has to say. He says, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That's great. So what do you think the Lord's will is for you in, in 2024? What do you think the Lord's will is for our church as this year unfolds? Do you think God wants our minds to be so saturated with worries? Maybe so saturated with all the anxieties that, that we bring upon ourselves. There's no room for spiritual thoughts. Do you think God wants our calendar so crowded that we don't have time for important things? Again, what do you think God's will is for you this year? Well, let's look at a couple possibilities. Possibilities to consider. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, we need to establish individual priorities. No, this isn't a management meeting. Oh, we're going to have a management meeting about priorities. It's not one of those. This is individual priorities. These are things in your life. We're all different. And that's the beauty. We're all different, but yet we come together as a unit. You know, I'm assuming that since you're in church this morning, that you believe that God should be a part of your life. You came out in this cold weather. God bless you. Don't get a cold and be safe on the way home. But so when you begin... To establish your priorities, you have to decide where God fits in your life. And to me, as a believer, 
I feel that that's the best place to start. Let's start with God. So ask yourself right now, what's the most important thing or who is the most important thing in your life right today? Give you a minute for your thought. Well, I don't want to give you a minute for your thought. Let me stop. My grandfather always used to say, don't give anybody a penny for your thought. Make them give you two cents. <laughs> yeah. Long story. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that my answer, and I'm hoping that your answer is going to be the same, that your relationship with God, your relationship with God through Jesus Christ is the most important thing to you. And if it is, put that right at the very, very tippy top of your individual priority list. Now, just don't put it up there and just don't say, well, I put God at the top of my list. No. I want you to promise yourself right now, if you put that at the top of your list, promise yourself right now that that is going to affect the choices that you make. That's going to affect the decisions that you make. That's going to affect the scheduling that you, that you make. That's going to affect the relationship that you have with others. My whole outlook on life is going to be based on that. God will come first in my life, and nothing's going to interfere with that. Period. You also need to prioritize some time each day to pray, to talk to God, to read His Word. And it doesn't matter when you do it. First thing in the morning, as soon as your feet hit the cold floor, or you're sitting at breakfast having your bowl of cereal or whatever, just remember to pray. But remember to pray for yourself. Seriously, pray for yourself. Pray for your family. Pray for the people around you. Pray for your church. God doesn't mind being flooded with prayers. He loves it. He'll take them morning, noon, night. And guess what? You'll find that you'll be blessed and you'll grow in your faith and your trust in God. We need to prioritize some time with your family. Now, I realize that that can be a difficult at times, especially if you're scattered all over the world, all over the U.S. It's hard. But whenever possible, spend as much time as you can together. And from the heart, always remember to include those who are sole survivors, the last members of their family, because they're church family. They're, they're members of the family of God. We got to include them. They're not out there by themselves. Pull them in tight and hug them. Just make the institution of family high on your priority list. And if you're still in the workforce, be the kind of person who gives an honest day's work. Because as Christians, we have a responsibility to God to honor him even in our workplaces. And it's important to remember as you establish these priorities to, to learn to live for today. Set that calendar aside. <laughs> Live for today. Two of the greatest enemies of time are regrets for things we did in the past and anxieties about what's going to happen to us in the future. Too many people today are still either living in the past or they're stalled out, worried about the future. Don't be one of those. There's no need to be. How many of us have said this? Oh, I just wish it would be like it used to be. Man, I hope next week is better. I can't wait for today to be over. And I'm not sure where this next one came from. I, I found it and I remembered it and I wrote it down. It's life is what happens to you when you're making plans to do something else. <laughs> well, it's kind of true. So what else can I say to you this morning? Other than another year has come and gone. A new year waits to be unfolded before us. And I believe that's why we need to have God included in it. God to help us, to help us redeem the time that we need so that you and I can make the best of our new year. And my theme or my title was, was my wish for us this new year. 
And that is, I want to encourage all of us as a church family to find enough happiness to keep us from being bitter and plenty of trials to keep us strong and maybe enough sorrow to keep us human with a little splash of hope to give each other a smile. And let's just mix all that with enough failure to keep us humble and the right amount of success to keep us eager and plenty of friends to give us comfort with enough wealth to meet our needs and the enthusiasm that will make us look forward to tomorrow with enough determination to make each day better than the day before. In Romans chapter 13, in verse 11, it says, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of the dark and put on the armor of light. That's my wish. Now, as our singers, our praise team comes forward to sing our song of invitation, I invite you to come forward if you need to, to come forward to ask for a prayer, to come forward to become a member of the church, to come forward to be baptized, to come forward just to say hi. If you need to come forward, we have elders. I'll be standing over here. Don't be afraid. Put God at the top of your list. So let's stand and pray before we sing. Father God, help us to remain faithful to you in everything that we do. Lord, we pray that everything that we've been doing has been glorifying your name. And, and if anything that we've done because of our selfish interests, uh, Father God, well, we ask for your forgiveness. May we be faithful to you during this new year, faithful in our homes and, and faithful in our families and faithful in our workplace and faithful in everything that we do because we've been taught by you. We want to live our lives according to scripture. And I ask everything in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.